Thanks, Manit. Uh, may I invite Dr. Mopatra and Dr. Tolani to come up on stage, and we'll get this session started. Vipin. So, uh, thank you, everyone. Thank you, IROC, for this uh, session and, uh, and uh, for giving me a chance to convene. So, we are going to con uh, show you 12 injuries of the PIP joint. I think uh, 12 is the maximum we could put because we have that many faculty. Uh, but so we'll, I'll start up with my presentation. So this is a acute PIP joint fracture dislocation, a cricket ball injury. Many of us see this type of injuries very commonly in our practice. So what has happened is that the joint is gone dorsally and there is a V sign. That means there is a hinging at the PIP joint. You see that the P2 is dislocated dorsally over the P1 and there is a volar lip fracture here. So this is the type of presentation we get. It is a jammed finger. The patient cannot flex the finger. So I am showing you one type of treatment method for this type of injury. There are many other methods to treat this injury. So what is the aim is to achieve a stable, painless and a mobile joint. So what I did is a Suzuki traction method. So this is a wire which we put through the condyle of the PIP. Another wire and a reduction wire. And finally, we put rubber bands across the joint to create a dynamic traction and reduce the joint. So at uh, immediately uh, post-op, this uh, is done under local anesthesia. We, uh, we check the movement of the patient. Yeah. So you check the range of movement and you, this is immediately post-op. So this is a dynamic traction method. You see that the patient is moving comfortably. This is the C-arm image. When the patient is moving, the, the dislocation is reduced and there is no V sign dorsally and there is good gliding of the joint. After this, uh, this is the type of, uh, in a lateral view, you have to see that the fixator is aligned in this way. Three weeks after post-op, the volar lip is united. 12 weeks, the flexion is uh, improved very well and the volar lip is united well and the dislocation is reduced. This is 12 week post-op, you see that the, the patient is having good range of movement. The use of, but I would like to say that you need to use Suzuki frame with a pinch of salt. So over distraction and, uh, can lead to vascular complications, hence, hence you need to call the patient every week for follow-up as shown by Dr. Parag in this paper where the, his patient was over distracted and it led to vascular complication. So this is another uh, case where a Suzuki was not done properly and five months later I had to do a hemi-hemet arthroplasty. So this is one way to treat the injury. Now Dr. Amit Varade, my colleague will speak on the other way to fix the PIP joint injury. Yeah. <clears throat> I thank uh, Bombay Orthopedic Society for giving this opportunity. So, this is actually, uh, I am presenting a case of acute uh, PIP joint injury. This 16 year boy had injury to left middle finger due to cricket ball and he presented to us after 5 days. So, if you, first, of, first thing, when we want to see such injuries, we have to do lateral view x-ray. And what all, what all we can see? That there is dislocation of the PIP joint, intra-articular fracture. And I thought it is dipunch type of variety fracture. <clears throat> and the uh, volar part of the fracture was migrated a bit distally. That's why it lost control and it, it went on dorsal side. So, we decided, since he was a very demanding patient, we decided to open it from the volar approach. Uh, volar approach, we take it, we take incision on the middle segment, open the A3 pulley, then release the collateral ligaments and we call, uh, we do it shotgunning of the joint. See, after shotgunning, we see that there is central depressed part of the articular surface and the volar lip has also gone distally. So, we have carefully elevated that intra-articular articular surface, middle part which was uh, dipunch fragment 
then uh, bone grafting was done from the distal radius the articular surface was kept back volar volar lip was pulled distally and it was fixed with a mini fragment screw 1 mm screw this is immediate post op and 3 uh, and 1/2 month follow up nicely restored articular surface of the base of the middle phalanx and uh, this this is the range of movement he has achieved after 3 and 1/2 months yeah thank you very much yeah so next speaker is uh, dr prashant prashant kamle will speak on neglected injuries of pip joint so uh, the idea is to cover all the type of injuries so acute uh, this is the, what i and dr amit said uh, spoke was not the only treatment but we could cover it in acute injuries now amit uh, prashant will speak on chronic injury six month old injuries of the pip joint and after that after him gautam will follow yeah prashant yeah and uh, thank you bombay orthopedic society and organizers uh, for giving me this opportunity i'm talking another way to how do we treat the neglected pip joint fracture dislocation here is a patient a uh, 30 year male had history of cricket ball injury so you must be seeing this all throughout the range all these are injury 99% by the cricket ball so again uh, this was the x ray done initially and treated uh, non surgically by the uh, another colleague to so 10 weeks pass he presented with this kind of a range of motion the extension there is lack of flexion and there is a stiffness also and the grip strength is also lost so this was the x ray done at 10 weeks i can see the ap and the oblique view but what is needed is the dead true lateral view which shows the dorsal dislocation and the uh the fragment which is now by this time is malunited so we have a patient of 10 weeks duration neglected fracture dislocation with the stiffness and we don't know the status of the cartil cartilage at this point of time so what is the treatment plan for this out of these all treatment we choose to do for the hemi hamet orthoplasty surgical plan is to excise that malunited fragment reduce the fracture dislocation harvest the hemihamet graft and fix with the uh, 1 mm or 1.3 mm screw so this was the surgical work up the really uh, pulley was released between a2 and a3 shotgun approach and you can see how much joint is uh, uh, the damage and there is almost depression and there is no articular cartilage almost in more than 50% so we measured the graft defect size exact graft matching uh, to the defect was harvested from the hamet this was the final trimming and the fixing of the graft with the 1.3 mm two screws and this was the intra op range of motion you can see the joint is stable congruous reduce and the stable so 3 weeks uh, we uh, put him in a extension block splint to reduce the uh, uh, extension and uh, this was the 7 years follow up and this was the uh, full function restored at 3 months time post surgery also so hemi hamet is indicated in acute condition also where the uh, fracture configuration does not allow to reconstruct it and of course in neglected patients but the prerequisite is it required uh, intact dorsal cortex where your graft and the screws are going to be placed so important point do the x ray properly on day one itself don't just do the pa and oblique view you need a true lateral view so that treatment can be uh, directed appropriately So hemi hamet is a reliable procedure for non reconstructable uh, fracture in acute setting and of course for the neglected pip fracture dislocations thank you dr gautam will speak on another way to treat a chronic dislocation uh, so he will tell us his point of view on the chronic dislocation so i'm going to talk on another way of doing the same thing in a chronic uh, dislocated pipj and uh, this is stood the stay uh, stood the time uh, test of time and it's been going on since 1980s so my patient is a 26 year old female uh, 
right hand dominant, it is a dominant hand. She fell down about a month, uh, 12 months ago, a year or a little bit more ago, and then presented with unable to move her IPG at all. So a stiff finger. That was her x-ray. This is a year down the line. She is completely dislocated at the PIPJ and been working as normal, but not able to make a fist. So this is what we did. So that is uh, my incision. I generally take a mid-lateral approach and then do dorsal extensions. Uh, then dissect the digital nerve and find the pulleys. Uh, you release the A3 pulley, you also release a little bit of A2 and a little bit of A4 pulley. And you can see just elevating a big flap. And on the third uh, picture, you can see the digital nerve on the side. Uh, I've just released a little bit of uh, a partial of the A4 pulley. So because it was 12 months old, it had a lot of scar tissue. So I had to differentiate normal tissue from scar tissue. And uh, we were able to manage that. I'm just differentiating the uh, boundaries of the tendons and the scar tissue around it. Uh, the joint is shotgun on the last video. Uh, there was tons of scar tissue, but luckily the volar plate was stretched out. So uh, I did a modified Eaton's approach for the uh, volar plate arthroplasty, which is uh, passing y, uh, 4 zero nylon in that fashion, and then reattaching the volar plate back. That is it closed. I put a dorsal wire to prevent uh, so do extension blocking wire to prevent any dislocation if there was going to happen any. This is her at two weeks. Uh, the wounds have healed. And this is her at two months. So the take home message really is identify them early, but uh, it can be treated late. It's not that it's end all and the patient has to live like this. It doesn't work like that. They have to be given a chance. Uh, we have finished on the volar lip dislocations. Now on the dorsal side, uh, Dr. Abhijit Vaigaukar uh, will talk us about his approach to the dorsal uh, injuries. Uh, good morning. Thank you very much for the opportunity here. And I think every now and then uh, you will come across um, the odd and the rare volar PIP fracture dislocation. This is a 38-year-old teacher. He's a weekend warrior, very interested in playing cricket over the weekend. And this is when he injured his index finger and presented with pain, swelling, and reduced range of movement. Uh, if you pay attention to the posterior anterior view, uh, to the untrained eye, we might miss what's going on with the index finger. However, if you notice very carefully, you would note that there is a little bit of loss of the joint space or the overlap of the PIP, which is put into evidence on the true lateral view. So always remember to take a true lateral view. And you can now see that there is a breach in the continuity of the dorsal cortex, and there is a resultant volar subluxation of the PIP. So what is the diagnosis? Any additional investigations? Usually not. The diagnosis is volar fracture dislocation of the PIP. And unlike the dorsal fracture dislocation, where more often than not you would want to immobilize inflection, look what happens when you treat this inflection. So this was initially treated with, a, with an extension block splint, which worsened the condition. So this is something which is a very straightforward condition, which can be treated either with K-wires or something of an internal fixation using a small fragment screw, which restores the anatomy and the function. 
Take home message very quickly. Uh, dorsal fracture dislocation is the most common variety of fracture dislocation that you would encounter, whereas the volar fracture dislocation is relatively rare with uh, a variant wherein there is a pilon fracture which involves both cortices with a central impacted fragment. The mechanism of injury is usually axial compression with volar directed rotational force. And um, there is a classification that has been published by Dr. Shrikant Chinsalkar, which is listed on this particular slide. And uh, there have been small uh, studies that have been published with reasonable range of movement for these conditions. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you, Dr. Abhijit. Dr. Kiran will uh, take us through uh, another his view on the dorsal sorry dorsal injuries of the PIP joint. Good morning, everyone. Thank Bombay Orthopedic Society for this opportunity. Uh, Dr. Abhijit presented about uh, our dorsal uh, lip fracture. The case which, which I would like to present is a, is a dorsal lip with a central impaction, a kind of pylon injury. This was the injury in a 26-year-old male IT professional, a cricket ball hitting onto the, onto the fingertip. And this is the main dorsal chunk with a central impacted articular cartilage. It was a closed injury. This is the this is the X-ray what we uh, what we got. Now look, looking carefully, uh, you can see the the, the dorsal fifty percent of the articular surface is impacted with the dorsal lip fragment. Now I tackle this. Uh, obviously, uh, this uh, if left conservative, it would have gone into stiff finger. So whether to operate, yes. Now closed or open. Now with the central impaction, uh, the cartilage impaction, and a dorsal lip fragment, very thin shell. Uh, fixation with a uh, with a open reduction and uh, um, mini mini screw would have been di rather difficult and could have gone the either way. So I chose this is static fixator frame. One can argue that static fixator frame in a in a form of distractor or I modified this uh, the kind of Suzuki frame or the dynamic external fixator frame what uh, Dr. Pippin showed. I just um, put this frame in a in a static mode with a rubber band traction. Now this was uh, this was at, at, at the time of fixation, and uh, you can see the central impactor fragment. I didn't do much to it, but maintaining the joint congruity, and this is sub subsequently the frame looked like. Uh, now this is at, at ten days where where you can see uh, the condyle on one side on the on the radial side also was was tending to displace, but just maintained in the static frame. In fact, that gave me the boost that good I didn't open it. At three weeks, it started to gum up and the joint line started to see well. At six weeks, it, it settled down well. This is the follow-up at... Uh, sorry. Yeah. Now, this is the follow-up at three months. For, to correct the flexion contracture, I gave him a Kepner splint. And with the Kepner splint, he continued to move. This subsequently, the follow-up uh, video which, which he meant, which he sent going good range of motion and this is a 1.5 years follow up. He was, he was doing well to the extent that he didn't come for the follow up, he sent me on a WhatsApp. And I, sorry, I don't have a post-op exit since he hasn't come back for follow up since he's doing good. Thank you very much. Kiran, the Dr. Warrior will give us a different aspect of PIP injury. The hyperextension, mostly the soft tissue injury, sir. Over to you. Thank you, Bipin. Here's a patient who came to me two weeks post his injury playing cricket. The stubborn, painful joint that just does not bend on his own volition or when I tried to bend it so there's no passive movements. And his x-ray shows that there's nothing dislocated, there's no fracture, the V sign is absent. Everything that you heard before is not there. It just springs backwards and refuses to come down. So what would you do? An ultrasound. An ultrasound showed a flake bo of bone and the volar plate was uh, avulsed. A better investigation would have been a 3T MRI done with special coils and you can then see it very, very clearly and you know now what the problem is. Is this a common injury? Yes, it is. It's missed always. So you need to go in by the same route that all the other previous speakers have been going into the PIP joint which has become fairly safe and well understood. 
You need to identify the, via, the, the roller plate. You need to then have anchors or use pull-out stitches. Now, pull-out stitches would cause a lot of problems on the dorsum, and therefore, it's better to use these anchors, although they are a bit expensive. And this is an old anchor. You see, we had to thread these anchors. Now you get them pre-threaded. So now you get them with ethy bond. That's a very strong material. We used to use proline in the good old days. And this is one that I used at that time. Subsequently, he went through rehab and ended up with an excellent result. <clears throat> do they do well? Yes, they do. They get almost full range of movements and a great grip strength. Here's another patient who's eight months in a post injury. He's out of the game. He's a professional cricketer and poor chap cannot wrap his little finger around the bat. And if you just hold your fist tight just now, you'll realize that all the power comes out from the little and the ring finger. And if you don't have that power, if it's just lift up the little finger, you realize how little he's going to be able to swing that ball across. So I suggested after seeing his x-ray that, you know, it's eight months and it looks like a bad joint. The MRI shows it very poor. I'm going to fuse you, but you're a cricketer. You need it to extend to catch a ball and you need to flex to hold the bat. The angle that's recommended is 55 degrees for the little finger. I templated this to see to go right across his bat and reduce that and found that 35 degrees would be good. We planned for fusion, consented him, opened him out, <clears throat> did an arthrolysis, saw the joint is looking much better than what the MRI showed me and therefore went on to reattach his volar plate just like we did in the previous case, rehabbed him and that's him. He became the highest paid rookie in the IPL and has gone on to represent the country over the last three years. So hyperextension injuries of the PIP joint, you need to suspect, identify and image them properly. Early reduction and maintenance is important. Rehab is of the utmost importance. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Warrior, for this excellent case. Dr. Bert will give us another aspect of, the simil of a similar type of injury. Thank you, organizers, for this opportunity. And I completely disagree with Dr. Warrior. He's shown one, one or two of the x-rays, but majority of your patients are these who come to your OPD with this kind of a, what's called as a jammed finger here. And you see atrocious splints given to these patients and finally it becomes actually permanently jammed. This is again a patient, not a cricket, but a volleyball injury with that little finger. If you see, there is a restriction of movement. And these patients, when you x-ray, you don't see much. If you see the classical PA and the lateral view, or the oblique view rather, you don't see much. And what you need to be seeing is that, that lateral view, that small flake of bone, very, very important for you to not miss this ola plate injury. There's other cases where you have to look for these. Look for these very carefully, the small flakes and clouds. And these are the majority of the patients who come with hyperextension injuries. And how much it can bend this, uh, the, the uh, PIP joint itself, it has its own nice anatomy there and it doesn't actually allow a lot of bending backwards. And most of the time it just ruptures at this point where the periosteum attachment is there, which is the thinnest part, portion. But most of these, actually these hyperextension injuries go to flexion contractures because of this attachment of the collateral ligaments and the A3 pulley. Why conservative in majority of these patients? This protocol is it's an, based on his old uh, study where even 10 degree of flexion can approximate the ola plate. You don't really have to go and fix these ola plates and the collaterals. And the pragmatic way of making a decision is obviously with an ultrasound because it's a very dynamic condition. You need to specifically ask the gap between the ola plate here and where it is going at the middle phalanx. So you can get these kind of reports and that is how your decision making happens. Splinting and functional treatment is what is required. Just about 10 degrees of that flexion based on the cadaveric report and you start moving these patients very early so that you don't develop uh, flexion contractures here. And then you should also know when to do the extension also because as I said the flexion contracture, there's about two weeks follow up. There's some amount of flexion and that is where you need to buddy tape them like this and start the extension of this. People have gone and seen with the dynamic ultrasound for follow-up also and when to start the extension, when the healing starts in these patients. The take-home message, functional treatment is the most important and sufficient for most of these hyperextension injuries and dynamic ESG is a pragmatic approach for decision-making. Thank you so much.
Thank you, sir. So the opposite injuries now, uh, opposite to extension. So it's a flexion type of injury. So it is a flexion deformity or a contracture. Dr. Patankar. Uh, blunt injuries of the PIP joint. In this, uh, the lateral x-ray, a dead lateral x-ray, the injury is often labeled as trivial and the x-rays are normal. And unfortunately, these are the most neglected injuries. This is an index case presented uh, with a blunt injury and uh, he presented after seven days. I gave her a splint. This was actively she was not able to extend but passively I could extend it and put a capnus splint. Unfortunately, ignorance on part of the doctors, neglect on part of the patient and even after giving a splint non-compliance can cause this horrible deformity at the end of two months. So, the flexion contraction is a very common problem following blunt injuries. We get three clinical scenarios when early presentation or late presentation and very late presentation. In early presentation, if you note the x-ray very uh, carefully, there is always a small hematoma there and you will find that the patient is unable to actively extend. But here, passive extension is possible. So, in this scenario, you always give a dorsal gutter splint let the patient have some pain. You can ask the patient to take anti-inflammatory drugs for about 5 to 10 days. But see that the patient keeps the finger extended for 2 weeks and then mobilize the patient in the same splint after 2 weeks and keep the splint uh, finger extended in the night. In the late presentations, patient come uh, with active extension not possible and passive extension is not possible and very, very painful. When you get this sort of appearance or facial uh, presence of the patient, then you know that this patient is going to respond to a capnus splint. So, this patient responded very well to a capnus splint. This is a method of passive stretching. Only thing is, this splint is quite painful. So, you have to teach the patient to adjust this capnus splint in this number one and number two position. The number one is at the level of the PIP joint and number two is at the level of the proximal phalanx. You can ask the patient to titrate the or move the splint to get re relieved of the pain. The splint is worn precautionary for a period of three months off and on and active exercises or active movements are permitted. In the very late presentation as you have seen, there is no extension, there is no stretch pain, the splint is ineffective and in this the only treatment is surgery. A volar incision is taken, the flexor sheath is released, the volar plate is released and after wound healing, the capnus splint is reapplied and patient gets a very good result. So, this is a, another very interesting case. This patient presented in January 2012. I gave him a splint. He did not wear it for some reason. And in February, he presented with inability to extend. So, that required a stretch. So, initially, you could give a splint. Then you stretch it. And he didn't even wear that. So, at the end, in April, he came for surgery. So, in all these cases in blunt injuries, prevention is better than cure. A dead lateral x-ray is very essential. Remember that recurrence is very common and be aware of the capnus splint. Make sure that you see that the vascularities of the tip is maintained before you discharge the patient. Over to Parag. Thank you. Dr. Parag will speak on uh, 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 acute state, uh, scenario. No, I am presenting on chronic scenario. Chronic? Okay, chronic, sorry. Yeah, chronic scenario. So, sorry, acute sorry. scenario, I agree to Dr. Patankar, sir. So, this is a central slip injury with the condylar fracture. A 24-year-old male, he again a post-cricket ball injury and this was the immediate post-op x-ray and this was the x-ray at uh, two months of implant removal. And then he presented to me at one year with this x-ray and this much degree of, uh, you know, Elson test, when we check the central slip, the active extension of proximal interphalangeal joint was absent, okay. And this was the deformity at one year. There was no pain at all. <coughs> so, this is how if patient is asked to extend the finger, he should be able to do it if the central slip is intact. And in this case, it was not possible. So, such patients, I personally feel that uh, splint may not work. 
and this is just another case to show how a central slip looks so this is how the central slip looks and on either side there are lateral bands they conjoin together and they form a extensor digitorum communis tendon insertion and this is how the this video shows how the evolution of central slip looks so in that case i planned a dorsal approach and first i assess the status of lateral bands on both the sides and then i found completely fibrous thin layer central slip in the center okay and this was the status of a central slip after separating it from the lateral band so when you separate it and do proper adhesive lysis you should be able to extend the digit if it is working so this was just not possible and in that case what i did i rift the central slip. i put a anchor into the uh, so the, i i cut this fibrotic portion of the central slip so this was the defect after cutting it and then i took a graph tendon graph from the extensor carpi radialis longus and i bridged that graft and the fibrous tendon was replaced with the bridge of the graft and for 3 weeks i transfixed the uh, pip joint so that is the reconstruction of a central slip and then the follow up at 3 months this is the elson test active extension at pip joint was initially not possible and now it is possible so the flexion contracture which was passively correctable and because of lack of central slip if you reconstruct it it can have a good result thank you so much thank you thank you parag so flexion deformity correction very well said dr patankar and dr parag have shown good cases dr pravin will speak on uh, condylar injuries now pip joint is all about condyles also the proximal phalanx yeah pravin yeah we have seen now a lot of injuries at the pip joint involving the joint as such and the base of the middle phalanx and we have seen there are many ways to skin the cat but cats also are different and sometimes the cats can be very tough we had this case which is quite rare one where the head of the proximal phalanx was totally shattered so it is very difficult to imagine how this injury would happen but there are almost six pieces there and all of them came out so we are not able to do any reconstruction at that sort the x-ray does did not look that bad the one small fragment over there but once we open we can see there are so many small small bone pieces so in the literature this injury is not very well defined and the options there was no option for fixation there was no option of joint replacement because patient was very young and also we cannot replace it with any bone graft because there are no known bone grafts we can replace the head of the proximal phalanx one option was arthrodesis but in a young patient in acute setting we thought we would try to do an option where we can restore some movement for this patient so we thought of this plan where volar plate was resurfaced over the head of the proximal phalanx a good amount of the head was excised so that volar plate goes and completely covers the head in such a way and it gave a good smooth surface to the head of the proximal phalanx now and we can see intraoperatively we can uh, we have a good range of movement there was no crackling at one year we see a good artificial joint space is formed there and it is maintained at one year follow up also and this is the outcome in this patient where he is got almost complete range of movement and he is not having any pain and he is quite comfortable doing all his activities so again to reemphasize going with the principle of orthopedics that movement is life and in pip joint even with the most severe injuries they can be tackled with timely and thoughtful intervention to give a mobile and pain free joint thank you thank you dr pravin uh, dr nikita will show us some fixations in the condyle yeah dr nikita small joint multiple injuries still the injuries are less but still Yeah. a very good afternoon everyone uh, so my first case is an acute fracture of the uh, of a, a unicondylar fracture of the proximal phalanx so in the ap view we see that the fracture is displaced there is some distraction at the fracture site but like it has been emphasized time and again that a true lateral view is very essential so when you look at the lateral view the condyle is completely flipped backwards now because this was an acute injury and because we were assuming that some at least some part of the collateral would still be attached to this fragment 
we took advantage of that and with close manipulation with the help of a k wire as a joystick we rotated back this fragment on the axis of the collateral and then fixed it with two k wires the fracture went on to heal very well and the patient regained full range of motion so now when we come to case 2 this is a completely uh, shattered bicondylar fracture one problem here is it is difficult to control these fragments with close manipulation so what we did here is we went in dorsally and through either side of the central slip approach this is a, this is another patient i'm just trying to show you how the approach was so we approached it from either side of the central slip reduced the fragments and fixed it with k wires now when you look at this x ray it does look like there are too many wires in such a small bone but it's not the number of wires that is important it is the size and the placement of the wire so these are 0.8 mm very thin wires that are used so that's the patient after the wire removal two months after the uh, uh, fixation with the uh, healing of the fracture with a good pip joint and good functional range of movement so let's go through a few approaches to the uh, pip joint dorsally so the dorsal skin approach can either be a straight incision a curved incision or a zigzag incision depending on which condyle we need to approach and the deep incision could be either uh, through the central slip or longitudinal incision along the central slip or like in this case between the central slip and the lateral band when we want to approach either of the condyles or through a chamaise approach where a flap distal base flap of the central slip is reflected and both the condyles can be approached and this is then sutured back with 40 proline with continuous sutures so this is a young athlete who had a cricket ball injury and was being treated elsewhere conservatively in an extension splint thinking that this is a minor injury this boy presented to us with a stiff and painful finger and when we did a dynamic view we realized that the uh, whole condyle is flexing forward because this was a coronal fracture like the hofas fracture of the proximal phalanx the condyle was flipping 180 degrees forward on flexion so now the problems here are one will we be able to control this in close procedure it is difficult two how do we fix it because a k wire from the volar side is difficult it is difficult to control this fragment from the dorsal side so we went ahead opened this fracture through the volar bruner's incision identified the fragment put it back uh, temporarily fixed it with a wire and then fi completed the fixation with a 1 mm screw the fracture went on to heal well and this boy got back to his sporting activities so the key points here are understanding the pattern of the fracture identifying the deforming forces and appro uh, uh, taking appropriate approach and proper dissection so that we reduce post operative complications and choosing the right kind and size of implant because these days there are fancy implants coming out every day in the market but even a traditional k wire if used very well can give very good results thank you thank you nikita what a wonderful array of such fabulous injuries which we never ever thought in the past the pip joint felt like a graveyard that all of these are going to get stiff and here you've seen the most stiff ones give you excellent results with these 12 presentations If there are any questions we'd be happy to take it uh, i am going to tell bipin to collect these 12 injuries and put it together and maybe send it to the ijo for a beautiful treatise because this is one of the most comprehensive pip joint sessions i've ever seen thanks bipin inspector sir thank you sir one question uh, hello yeah question yeah, <coughs> yeah. Uh, my question is to dr warrior sir sir how do you make a proper decision in say a dorsal uh, pip joint dislocation whether to put a suzuki frame or to put in some screws or put a dorsal block matlab uh, initial patient maybe usually we get the patients a little late how do you actually plan it uh, i'm going to ask bipin to say a few words first about the suzuki frame what do you so, how do you decide for the so, suzuki so frame so suzuki frame uh, with my ex limited experience of 4 5 years i feel that it should be if you know how to do it then only do it otherwise do not do it because we have faced lot of complications before even i have faced complications and we know how to salvage out of it so you should know how to salvage out of it it is a very good frame easy frame to put in but then the complications are very high 
So if you know, don't know the dynamics, I think we should not do it. That means so to, uh, to uh, take it further, you first see the size of the fragment. If the size of the fragment is large, now there is 30%, 50% and more, etc. But if it's an unstable fragment, where when you reduce it to 20 or 30 degrees of flexion, it still remains unstable, then you need some form of fixation to hold it in flexion. So you need an extension block splint or a fixator or an extension block wire to hold it down. A Suzuki frame is used usually when there are small fragments which you can't hold. So then it's good to use a Suzuki frame where even if it's an unstable and you can reduce it with the traction, you can hold it in that position and allow flexion. And the last is, when would you open it? So if you have a fragment that's big enough to hold, you can open it. But otherwise, it's difficult once you open it with the small fragment, then you've got to fall back on the volar plate arthroplasty kind of procedures. I see Dr. Subnish raising his hand. Yes, sir. Yes, please. Yes. When is the indication for fusion in a late presentation? Hemant. Uh, as uh, Sudhir has said, probably there is no indication of fusion in the little finger. In the index finger, you can consider fusion. Or if, if it's an absolutely hopeless joint, but I would think of fusion in the index finger, but I would definitely think of other options in the little finger, if I can help it. Thank you. Manit is sending me uh, messages saying, please get off the stage. Thank you very much. I think we've had a wonderful, wonderful session and it only shows that we need more of these sessions and thank you Bipin again.